who don't consume enough potassium, they end up having higher risk of developing chronic kidney disease. Because of the fact that if you're eating potassium, once again, you are lowering your blood pressure. So such a simple and fascinating thing. Now, when, when it comes to, especially Americans, we are obsessed with our calcium. Um, it's, it's a very fascinating phenomenon because people feel like, I got to take more calcium because my bones are weak. And what people forget is, is the only way that the bones will take in calcium is if there is a need for them to take in calcium. Otherwise, all the excess calcium you're putting in your body, it's just going to go and deposit inside tissues, inside your blood vessels and lead to calcification. So this concept of you got to have all this calcium is tricky because the calcium has to get taken into the bones and not end up inside your blood vessels. This is why we talk about things like vitamin K2, specifically the MK7 version, and why it's so interesting because some of the data shows that K2 can take the calcium you're absorbing and send it to the bones instead of sending it to the tissues. And so it, it makes an interesting phenomenon. Uh, there's a question in the chat. It was Patrick. Patrick said, when do you conclude there is kidney disease? Is it uh, if the function of the kidney? Okay, so great question. Let's go back to the basics of what is the definition of kidney disease. We use a marker called estimated GFR or glomerular filtration rate. And the way that we measure kidneys function is we measure something known as creatinine. And creatinine, it comes from your muscles. It's a waste product. Now, People often confuse creatinine with creatine, which bodybuilders use to build muscle. Creatine, if you take it enough, you'll put it inside your blood. It will convert to creatinine. It will make it look like you have kidney disease. So how do we use creatinine to measure kidney function? Well, first is we use creatinine to measure it indirectly. We're not measuring kidneys directly. We're doing it indirectly. So the way we say it is the more creatinine in your blood, that means the less your kidneys are functioning because the job of the kidneys is they will get rid of the creatinine through your kidneys out into the urine. So if the kidneys aren't working that well, creatinine builds up in the blood. Now, what's considered normal? Well, complex question. Let me make it simple. The simple answer is, is if your kidney function is more than 60, if your eGFR is greater than 60 and you have no protein in the urine, then by definition, you don't have kidney disease. If your eGFR is greater than 60, but you have protein in the urine, you do have kidney disease. So the definition of kidney disease is protein in the urine. And then we look at what is your creatinine, plug it into a formula to get the eGFR. The stages of eGFR, they start at stage one, which is 90 and above. Remember, if you're 90 and above with no protein in the urine, you're not stage one. Then there's 60 to 90, which is stage two. Once again, that's only considered stage two if you have protein in the urine. Then is stage three, which is 30 to 60. We put it as stage 3A, which would be 45 to 60. Stage 3B, which is 30 to 45. Stage four, is 15 to 30, and anything below 15 on the eGFR is stage five or is dialysis territory. So if somebody tells you, if your doctor says you have kidney disease, that means that either you are below 60 or you could be higher and you're spilling protein in the urine. All right, Patrick, I hope that answers your question. Let's keep going. So calcium guidelines. When we start to look at calcium, and we start to look at the guidelines around this. What's really interesting is, is that there isn't sort of a formal research study based on what the amount should be, but most people in general say you really ought to be less than two grams a day of calcium. That includes food and any supplements and all that stuff when you have chronic kidney disease. And the reason this is so interesting and tricky is there's another study and, and very small study, but another gold study, in my opinion, that I love. And I use this to educate people on a very simple concept. When they look at people taking about 800 milligrams of calcium a day, what they find is, is 
that the people who took that much, they had about a negative balance. And if you have a negative balance, that means if you need to maintain your calcium levels, you might be leaching it from your bones or they were neutral. So somewhere around 800, maybe not the optimal level. Then they looked at, well, what if we gave them two grams, more specifically than two grams of calcium a day? Here's what they found. This, this is a really interesting concept. So what they found was that there was a positive calcium balance. And the reason this matters is, is because as you were taking in more calcium, the question becomes is where the heck did this calcium go? So if you have excess calcium, you're in a positive calcium balance, you have more calcium than your body needs. Let's find where the calcium went. So they look at it and they say, well, let's look at the blood. The blood levels were normal for the calcium. So the calcium did not raise the blood levels. That means the calcium went somewhere else. Then they looked at the urine. And the question was, well, if you take in excess calcium, don't you expect the urinary calcium to increase because you're trying to get rid of it? So they found that the increase in urine calcium wasn't there either. All right, so they didn't come out in the stool. It didn't really come out in the urine, the blood levels did not go up. Where the heck did this calcium disappear to? You took in all this calcium, where did it go? It turns out that that calcium is ending up in your tissues. And this is why it matters so much because as it goes in the tissues, it's gonna cause calcification. It hardens your blood vessels, it's gonna go there, and it's gonna make it so that once those blood vessels are hardened, your risk of having a heart attack, a stroke, gets dramatically worse. All right, then we get into phosphorus. And phosphorus, by the way, is everywhere. You know, what's interesting about everything that we're talking about today is too little of any one of these items will kill you. Too little of salt, too little of potassium, too little of calcium, or too little of phosphorus will kill you. And yet, too much will do the same. And this is why life is so beautiful, because there's this sweet spot. There's a balance. And just like in your own life, you want to be able to find a balance in your relationships, in your exercise, in all of the things that you're doing is, is you don't need to go to the extreme. There is a sweet spot where moderation actually becomes quite interesting. Now, phosphorus is interesting because when we talk about phosphorus, the concept here is, is you really want to be less than a gram or less than 1,000 milligrams per day of phosphorus. And this becomes really important because once again, there's conflicts over who says this, but what you wanna take away from this is aim for less than a thousand. Okay, why does this matter? Because when we start to look at phosphorus and the risk of death, it's pretty interesting that as you start to get more phosphorus present in the body, you do a number of things. And those things are that you start to affect lots of different parts of the body. You start to affect your parathyroid gland. And this thing starts to get larger and larger because the parathyroid is going to focus on telling the kidneys to get rid of phosphorus. And you'll see that your PTH hormone is climbing. What do, but what does PTH or parathyroid hormone do? It breaks down the bones as well. It's telling the kidneys to get rid of the phosphorus, but it's also breaking down the bones. So not necessarily the best thing. And you'll see that phosphorus has so many impacts. It has impacts on the para, which means next to the thyroid. Actually, it has nothing to do with the thyroid gland. It just means it's next to the thyroid. So that's parathyroid. It's also going to end up affecting bone health. It's also going to end up affecting calcification. So calcium and phosphorus will combine together. They will, or we use a fancy word called precipitate and get stuck inside all your blood vessels. So as you start to increase phosphorus in your blood, this is a serum value. So in other words, we did a blood test and we saw that your phosphorus went up. What you'll find is that your risk of death goes up significantly as the phosphorus starts to go up. And now, when we get into plant-based diets, the reason this is so powerful of a topic is because not all phosphorus is created equal. So in other words, when we talk about things like phosphorus, we talk about inorganic and organic. Specifically, the difference between the two is that inorganic phosphate 
it has almost a hundred percent absorption. So the take home is, is inorganic is really all your processed foods. And that's where it matters, plus things like sodas, et cetera. But when you start to look at organic phosphate, the organic phosphate has a significantly less absorption, specifically less than 60%. And that's the not processed sources. So these are the animal and plant sources of phosphorus. So if we stop right there, you can see that the message is very simple. Get rid of processed foods. The less processed foods you eat, the healthier you're going to be. But it gets even better because then we can take this 60% number here and now let's compare animal versus plant sources. So when we start to compare animal base, what we find is that yes, that's the 60% is absorbed by the gut. But as we start to get to plant-based sources, because we lack this phytase enzyme, what you'll end up finding is it's way harder for us to absorb the phosphorus from plant-based sources. As a result, very little, 10 to 30% is getting absorbed. So this concept of eating more plants is that the more plants you eat, the less animals you eat. And of course, if I go back here, the less processed foods you eat, the lower your phosphorus in your blood is going to be. And this is why dialysis patients, when they're struggling to control their phosphorus, I try to explain to them, look, if I can get you to eat less processed foods and less animal-based products, you're actually going to do yourself a world of good because the risk of death on dialysis is dramatically high. It's about 50% in five years. And that is a very very substantial number. In fact, when we look at dialysis patients, one in five patients on dialysis die every year. So to give you a little bit more information on this, let's look at an example here. This is what we call the phosphorus to protein ratio. It's a very simple analogy. And what we're seeing here is you're looking at a very busy slide. And it's basically talking about the phosphorus to protein ratio. Why? Because if you were somebody on dialysis, what would you want? You would want this ratio to be low because you want the lowest amount of phosphorus and the highest amount of protein in it. So the higher the protein when you're on dialysis, the better. And so what do we find? Let's compare two things just randomly because both have the same phosphorus to protein ratio. Cheese does and lentils do. Now, here's what's fascinating, right? If you look at both of these guys, cheese, which has a phosphorus to protein ratio of 20, has 131 milligrams of phosphorus, your absorption in it is significant. Whether it's 60% or higher, you're going to absorb most of this. But when you start to look at lentils, what's fascinating about lentils is look at how little the absorption is. So even though lentils may have a little bit more phosphorus in them, what you'll find is your absorption. The only thing that matters is how much you absorb. So you'll find that your absorption of phosphorus is significantly less. Now, magnesium. It's a funny thing that we don't focus enough on the power of magnesium, but magnesium is a fascinating, fascinating phenomenon because of the fact that what we end up finding with magnesium is that few things. First is when we look at blood pressure, magnesium is fascinating because it can lower your blood pressure. And there's all these complex mechanisms, but essentially it will relax the blood vessels, reduce vascular tone, and in result, it will lower your blood pressure. So magnesium is a fascinating thing to do. It's also involved in insulin resistance. And so what happens there is, is it will lower your insulin resistance. It will help to dispose of blood sugars. And if you talk about the flexibility of blood vessels, what you'll find is, is that ensures that the endothelial lining of your blood vessels is able to flex and expand and flex and expand. And as a result, it's basically helping with inflammation. It's lowering the risk of stuff that's going to cause blood clots. And overall, it's preventing a number of very substantial complications. And so when we talk about recommended intake, there's a lot of information there, but it's basically the take-home message really is, is for adults, it's between 
310 milligrams or so goes all the way up to about 420 milligrams. Don't need to remember any of that. What you do want to remember is that there are some really good sources of magnesium. For example, pumpkin seeds, chia seeds, which are excellent in fiber, nuts, which are awesome anyways, but nuts also are a great source of magnesium. Spinach is a great source, beans, soy products. And so you can see that you got all of these options. And I just picked these because these just give you some ideas on what you can start doing right away. Now, let's shift gear and talk about what America is obsessed with. And what America is obsessed with is protein. In fact, everybody talks about the idea that we need to eat more protein. In fact, if you heard me just now, you would have also heard that I've been talking about eat more protein in dialysis patients. But what about chronic kidney disease? Why does it matter how much protein you eat? Because the amount of protein you eat, the acidity of that, acidic foods, those are animal foods, those are animal proteins. What they do is the acid eats away essentially at our kidneys. So when we talk about protein, there's a lot of like disagreements on what's the ideal amount. But essentially, the concept is, is somewhere between 0.6 to 0.8 grams per kilogram per day. So grams per kilogram per day. So whatever your weight is, divide your weight in pounds by 2.2, and you will be able to find what your weight in kilograms is. 